Good afternoon. You are attending the, the hearing officer public hearing for Tuesday, February 6, 2018. Today's meeting is called to order. My name is David Williams. I am the City of Tempe's hearing officer. The City of Tempe hearing officer is authorized by Arizona revised statutes and the City of Tempe zoning and development code. And the hearing officer has the duty to carry out the provisions and intent of the City of Tempe uh, general plan and zoning and development code and he has granted the authority to conduct public hearings to review and may either approve continue deny or approve with conditions several types of cases including use permits variances and property abatements on today's agenda uh, we have uh, six items including a set of meeting minutes to approve two variance cases and three excuse me five use permit requests as the hearing officer, I have reviewed the, carefully the City of Tempe Community Development Department report on each of the items on today's agenda. Uh, and I will use the information that report during the meeting and during the deliberations. Additionally, I have visited each of the properties uh, on the agenda today to help me understand the conditions in the neighborhood, the conditions on the subject property, uh, to understand um, what the request is and help me make an informed decision. To all applicants uh, and interested citizens, when your request is called or when you wish to address the hearing officer, that's great. Please step up to the front of the room to the microphone and state your name and city of residence. If you are a person other than the applicant and you want to speak, that's fine also. But please fill out a white speaker card uh, when you come up to the podium and hand that off to staff over here to my right. And those white speaker cards are on the table at the front of the room and there's some on the table at the back of the room as well. Again, please hand those in if you come up, if you're someone other than the applicant. Uh, each citizen, each person's given about three minutes to speak. Uh, any person who might be aggrieved by a decision of the hearing officer today may file an appeal within 14 calendar days after the date of the hearing officer decision. So, the, de the deadline for appealing decisions made at today's hearing officer meeting is 3 p.m. February 20th, 2018. Uh, that date again is, and time is 3 p.m. February 20th, 2018 to file any appeals from decisions taken today. Appeals of the decisions of the hearing officer are heard either by the Board of Adjustment or the Development Review Commission, whichever body uh, is appropriate to the type of case that's being appealed. In the case of a property abatement, uh, if the property owner doesn't bring it into compliance, the, the property is corrected by the city. We don't have any abatements on today's agenda, so I won't read further the description of abatement cases. I do want to introduce a couple folks before we get started. Again, over to my right are some of the City of Tempe staff members, including Steve, Steve Abrahamson. He's a principal planner, Diane McGuire, administrative assistant, and Lee Jimenez, a senior planner. Okay, we're going to jump right into our first agenda item. Got all that formality stuff out of the way. That's consideration of the meeting minutes from our January 16th meeting. Um, I did review those minutes uh, prior to today's meeting. Uh, they are in order and they are approved as presented uh, in the meeting packet. Thank you, staff. We're going to move on then to agenda item number two. This is a request for approval of a variance to reduce the front yard building setback for the Boyd residence in its case PL170377. Uh, and the Boyd residence is at, located at 1520 North Soaro Drive. The applicant is Ron Boyd. Can we have a report from the staff, Mr. Jimenez? Good evening, Hearing Officer Williams. My name is Lee Jimenez. I'm a senior planner with the Community De um, Development Department in the Planning Division. The Boyd residence is located on lot 141 of the Cavalier Hills 1 subdivision south of East Hancock Avenue and west of North Saguaro Drive within the R16 single family residential district. The applicant, Ron Boyd, is requesting a variance to reduce the required front yard building setback from 20 feet to 2 feet for a two car garage addition. According to city records, the home was originally constructed in 1960 with a two car. Uh, carport that was later converted into a den. The required off-street parking was uh, shifted to a carport in 1969 and was later converted into a garage where in 
1989, uh, a variance was obtained to reduce the required side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet. A neighborhood meeting was held at the Boyd residence on Wednesday, December 20th, uh, 2017 at 6 p.m. Three, uh, three neighbors attended the meeting and none were opposed to the variance. To date, no public input has been received by staff. Based on the information provided by the applicant, the public input received, and the analysis provided in the staff report, staff does not support the variance request and does not believe the application meets all the required criteria for a variance. Nonetheless, the proposed garage addition is a prime candidate for a use permit standard, wherein the front yard building setback may be reduced by 20% from 20 feet to 16 feet, uh, where, uh, of which staff can support. Uh, however, should affirmative action be taken on this request, the conditions of approval provided in the staff report shall apply unless amended at this hearing. And I'll be available should you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. So this is a request to go from 20 feet to 2 feet, right? Um, and then down in our little summary paragraph, item number 1, page 1 of the staff report, proposed building setback 0. Is there another setback that's 0, or that's the one that should be, that should be 2? That might be a, a typo. Originally it was zero, and then uh, the recent submittal of plans okay. indicated two feet. It evolved a little bit. Okay. That's correct. Gotcha, a revision. Understood. Okay, and I understand there was prior variances for other setbacks and conversions of carports to living space, et cetera. Um, any input from any other departments on this particular case? No, okay. you're not, Mr. Williams. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you. Is the applicant here or the representative? Come on up. Welcome. You. Okay, this is what it is. Hey, my name is Ron Boyd. I live at 1520 North Sorrell Drive. Welcome. We've lived there for, we've owned this property for 19 years, and the entire time we've owned it, we've always regretted this flat roof garage and looked forward to a time when we could build a larger garage. The biggest challenge that we have, uh, the, the, the homeless, the transients, and all of the foot traffic in our neighborhood, uh, if you leave something outside, it's going to disappear. I've had, I can produce probably a dozen police reports of burglaries and thefts that involve my vehicles. Um, Super Bowl Sunday two years ago during halftime, I caught a guy outside in my truck. I couldn't catch him because I'm fat. But the police, Timby PD caught him and he was arrested. I've had the tailgate stolen off of my truck. If you leave anything in the back of your truck at night, it's gone. The, the now picture sort of obscures uh, where the, our Sequoia is parked, but we park both of, our via, both of our trucks right there. And all I'm simply asking is to just swing them around and park them closer to the house and park them inside instead of outside. Uh, the visibility of the alley is greatly increased. It, it gives humongous ing ingrid ingress into the alley and out of it. Um, anytime you can park off of, get off of the street. This is an older neighborhood, but mm -hmm. it's sort of in a renaissance and a lot of young families with kids are moving and there's a lot more bicycle activity. And if there's a car on each side of the street, it, that's only a three car wide access way and it bottlenecks the street down to one lane. That has to be shared by cars and kids on bikes. And I've seen it several times where it's a close call. So if I can keep my vehicles off the street, I prefer to do it. If I can keep them inside, I absolutely prefer to do it. We've planned and saved for this for a long time. And I, I, I see no drawbacks as far as you know, negative. Um, it increases the safety, it increases our security. It, it makes us comfortable and gives us peace of mind at night because everything is inside and locked up and it, increase, it obviously increases the value of our home because the aesthetics become completely different to get rid of that flat garage. But it also, it also increases the aesthetics of the street and the subdivision in general. So 
I think as it sits, this is 100% win for the subdivision and the neighborhood. Thank you for the information. And the height on the, the new garage is 14 feet? Is yeah, it would be the same height as the house. Because the, right now, the, the garage has a flat roof. Right. And it's, you know, it's made out of wood. It's, it leaks. It's full of termites. It's, it's a problem. It's low-quality construction. So what I want to do is replace it with a pitched roof that matches the color and the texture and the shape of the rest of the house. So looking at, looking at your photos, these are excellent. Thanks for bringing them in. Uh, the, there's an area basically north of your home. It's like a triangular area at the corner of the alley and the street. What happens with that area after construction? It looks, the, the curb line looks a little different in the photos. So I'm having trouble there. Well, I could put, you know, we're going to have to repour that valley gutter and approachway. So if, mm -hmm. depending on what the building department wanted, we could put, you know, you could make that 20 feet wide, 30 feet wide, 40 feet wide, and then just bring that return around to the back of sidewalk and then make the rest of it landscape. Okay. So, so there's a, basically a triangle of your property, right? Yeah, on yeah. the north elevation of this garage building. Talking about right in here? Yeah, and a little bit to the right. Yeah. So I would just kick, I, my plan would be to just bring this radius around like this and match whatever is over here. And I could make the width of this whatever you guys would require. Okay. Yeah, I see. But you have to maintain the width of the sidewalk and the, and the crossing here as the yeah. same. So. so maybe the shadow that's fooling me a little bit on the footprint versus where the alley is. Um, it looks like the alley gets real wide after, with the... The after photo. Yeah, I mean, this this alley is going to be nice. I mean, here it'll be wide. If you come around to get in, get in and out of the alley, it's going to be. You could control it and move that curb over, that return over some, and make the alley entrance more narrow. But I have no objection to keeping that all open. Okay, you don't think that'll attract problems with people parking right there, or is hanging out right there on your? It's essentially your property, right? Yeah, I don't think so. There's a. There's a pole light immediately. There's, there's a pole light that's, this right here is a, a light and, oh, yeah. Right here, yeah. Yeah, and you can see right there, mm -hmm. I contracted with SRP several years ago and had a security light put in. So at night, all of this is now lit up really well and it, and it deters on the burglaries and the break-ins on the alley side that we've had. I also own the house directly behind here, so I know that neighbor won't object either. Okay, and then just a question about the design, looking at the, the floor plan. Uh, is this a double deep garage? Is that? No. Um, it's single. Okay, because I see 35 feet deep. That's, that's no. almost double. About 20 feet standard, 18, about 20 is standard. Oh, oh well, hmm. on, on width, I think that's, the width of it was 35 feet. Okay. Oh, I see. I got you. Yeah, it's twenty-four oh, it's feet. Tr twenty-four oh, okay. feet deep. Yeah, thank you. That okay. So, and then um, before I let you go, just one other point too. My concern is how close it is to the street and the sidewalk. How that kind of pinches down there, um, where that two foot is. That's that's a significant concern I'm having too in terms of what that does, as you, particularly on the inside of a bend. It just kind of precludes seeing around the bend a little I bit. Mean, at this point, I'm in, you know, I'm sort of in the exploratory part of this. I'm willing to go back, you know, like put a five foot buffer in there. So, but I just, you know, before, in order to start getting construction bids and sort of making final plans, I kind of have to ask right. you guys. I want, obviously, I want to build it as big as I can build it because it's storage and okay. we need it. Got it. Thank you very much. I may need to call you back up. Let okay. me see if there's anyone else you'd like to speak on this case. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else who's here today who wants to speak on agenda item number two, uh, Boyd request for uh, variance? Welcome. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, my name is Sherry Lesser, and I live uh, approximately three houses away from Mr. Boyd. It's here on the map. It's not shown on your map, but I live approximately right here, right um, just around the corner next to the alley. And I've known the boys as long as they've lived in this residence. Our sons play together. Ms. Lesser, did you do a white speaker card for us? Yes, did I did. Yes, Thank I did. You. Thank you very much. I wouldn't go far without turning that in. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So anyway, I'm here today to um, to uh, support Mr. Boyd's request for a variance. Um, I respectfully disagree with um, the senior planner's position that it does not meet the test for a variance. And, um, and I could go through each point, but basically it does meet all the tests for approval of a variance. We have, number one, a ton of topography. We are probably the most, have the most topography of the, all the neighborhoods in Tempe. Um, my yard in particular, I have uh, a difference in height of the land from zero at the street front, it goes up to six feet in my rear yard. My front yard is four feet off the sidewalk. And in Mr. Boyd's case, when you come off the alley from the side here, down here, you would land right down in his yard. He's at a low point within the topography. And we have very unique shaped lots, which makes it a challenge if you right. want to add on to your lot. Um, his being that his goes almost like a boat shape. It's like the front of a boat. And I would say that if he had, uh, if this was a hard point right here, this was a corner, this would technically be a side yard and he wouldn't need the variance. It would be a zero setback because you'd have zero on the side, zero on this side. Or if it was considered a side yard next to the alley. Um, I travel this route. I travel the route daily on my exiting the neighborhood. There is going to be no visibility problem because right behind him is a block wall. That is the backyard to the neighbor to the uh, residence that fronts um, Hancock. So as far as impeding any visibility, it's actually going to increase the visibility of the alley opening. Um, so we can see those people who are about to break into our houses and still are our, our um, all of our own property, which I have been burglarized myself three times in this neighborhood. And so having anything that, that you can put your belongings inside the building is probably um, a benefit to him. And it's a benefit to us as well for, for him to locate his vehicles off the street. Because as he said, when people park up and down the streets, and they do, if you look further north to McAllister, it, it's, it, it's lined with cars daily. Um, with people on the off street parking and it one impedes pedestrian flow because people park up on the sidewalk when it's a rolled curb and also it impedes um, vehicular traffic because you just so that's all I have to say I'd be happy to answer any questions I don't uh, are you aware of any other three car garages in this immediate neighborhood um I'm trying to think I don't think there's a three-car garage, but I don't really see where that's material to this request. I mean, what, what he wants to use the personal space for, it could be storage and two-car well, garage. Just so you know, it goes to my interpretation of the criteria and, you know, the, the uh, regulations applying evenly across similar no, I properties. Think, I think there's been justification for him to receive a reduction in the variances. There have been several variances granted in the neighborhood, some to zero at street frontages for other street side yards, that is, for garages. So I think uh, Mr. Carraway is one of them who received a variance from the same. So and I'll let him speak next. So I'm on the other side. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on agenda item number two? Come on up. Hi, my name is Lane Carraway. Uh, I was hoping, do we have a map of the neighborhood by chance, Steve? Yeah, we do. I better now, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Where am I at? You're located right, right there. Okay, I'm right here. 
I originally was going to do a three car garage. I have a stop sign at a cul-de-sac, but which by the way was missing for nearly eight years, the stop sign. So I could not do a three car garage simply for a stop sign. I think I could have pushed the issue with the city being a cul-de-sac and so forth and had the three car garage. Uh, you asked the question if there were any three car garages. I'm basically less than six inches to have a three car garage. Uh, the neighbor at Han corner of Hancock and McAllister is a six car carport. Uh, I know carports are considered differently than a garage, but if you look at that structure, I'm sure you drove by there. They call it the mausoleum house, and it's almost, I would consider almost two stories tall, the structure. So the, throughout our neighborhood, people are doing, putting their own touches and making them from a 1960s home to 2018 for people to be able to, A, do their cars. The reason I wanted a three-car garage, I have three vehicles. I have had everything, my cars have been broken in numerous times. I've had wrought iron chairs out on the front, including cushions picked up. I have security cameras. You can actually watch the people pick up the things and take them around. Would I like to have my other vehicle in, the, in a garage secure? Yes, we have an issue with homeless. We have an issue with drugs and so forth. I applaud Mr. Boyd and I for doing this because he's been broken in more times than I can count. And the boys, since I've known them since they moved in, they have their landscaping, they keep their place perfect, they go beyond their means to make the neighborhood better. They've worked with the neighbors. I, as the chair for the neighborhood, I've probably spoken to two dozen people, and they're all for this because it does, it's going to get rid of what looks like a add-on and make it look like it was always there. And that's what most people are doing in the neighborhood. They're not trying to make something look like it's an add-on. They're trying to fix the old problems which they have purchased these homes and so forth and make them look like they were originally built this way. So I, we fully support this addition and this project. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them too as well. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate your time coming today. Anyone else in the audience like to speak yeah. on agenda item two? Come on up. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. I need to get you to do a speaker card too. I will do that. Yeah, my name is Charles Payne. Um, where's that? I can show you where I live. Okay, we'll get you a map up. You still have that map? We'll get it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's see. This one. Okay. Is not okay, this is Hancock, right? That is Hancock. Yeah, okay. I live uh, right here on the corner of uh, Hancock and McAllister. It would be the northeast corner. Mm -hmm. uh, I've known okay. them, the Boyds. I've known them probably since about shortly after they moved in. Uh, Ron does take very good care of his yard it's one of the nicer ones i don't have a problem with the garage uh, i can see actually from where my house is on the corner down to ron's property there it looks mm -hmm. i don't see a problem at all i think it will add something to the neighborhood my opinion um, that's about all i can do i just want to know i'm i'm happy with whatever ron's doing there okay Right. Great. Yeah. Thanks again for coming today. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, anyone else? Agenda item two. Okay. Um, question for staff, uh, Mr. Jimenez. So the corner of this garage is two feet from the property line, right, as proposed? That's correct. Is that also then is. two feet from the sidewalk? Uh, the property line is... Um, I would say approximately two feet behind the sidewalk. Okay. Do you know the sidewalk width? At that uh, point? Given the age of the subdivision, I would say it's probably maybe 36 inches to four feet. Three to four feet. I'll ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Boyd, actually. Okay. That's all I had for staff. All right, Mr. Boyd, can I talk to you again, please? May I speak with you? Um... 
I certainly agree your, to shape your property is difficult. Um, and uh, listening to one of your neighbors, Ms. Lesser, understanding topography can also play um, a role in making things difficult to fit. Um, I am concerned about criteria three and four, um, particularly criteria three, and it just that close to the sidewalk. Um, I'd like to push it back some, about eight feet or so. Can you live with that? I could. Okay. That's all I needed. All right. Thanks, okay. Sir. So that would make it a total of 10. Instead of two, it would be 10 back. Okay. All right. Then we got everybody who wanted to speak. This request uh, for variance is approved, uh, subject to the conditions in the staff report. There are several criteria or uh, well, criteria that need to be addressed in granting a variance, and I want to put those in the record in case anybody has concerns later. Uh, and the first one I'd mentioned and staff did, uh, and also the neighbors did, that the shape of this property is kind of a teardrop uh, or water droplet, which makes putting square buildings out a particular challenge. Uh, there's also a topography issue, but in this case, it's this point um, that I can appreciate creates some, some hardship. Um, that uh, number two is a strict application of the code will deprive the property of privileges enjoyed by others in the same neighborhood. You know, I did question about the size of the garage. The applicants agreed to reduce that a little bit. I certainly am sensitive to the idea to want to secure your property and have a home that you can defend. Um, so I think we've met that criteria as well. Um, in terms of giving you the bigger garage that you'd like, but also as this is on the inside of the bend of a road, the closer that is to the street, you won't see the road as you come down there like you used to, which will cause hopefully slow people down, which is a good thing, but they'll have a little bit of loss of vision. Pushing it back that extra eight feet, I think we'll address that, which is why I asked if uh, perhaps traffic had commented on this. It's the type of thing they can get involved in. Uh, number, uh, um, criteria number three, grant of special privileges and consistent with the limitations on other properties in the neighborhood. Uh, we've discussed there are other multi-car carports and garages in this neighborhood. And I heard testimony to that, to that effect today. Um, I am satisfied that that criteria has adequately been met. And then number four, the variance is not granted if the special circumstances applicable to the property are self-imposed by the property owner. Um, certainly, you didn't create the shape or the difficulty there. You did purchase the property with it pretty built up, so we're really close to the maximum coverage also that can be allowed. Um, and I don't know if you knew it at the time, but a carport had been given up for living space. So based on those four criteria being met, uh, the variance is approved for a setback of 10 feet uh, from the property line. And good luck with your project, and thank you for the extra information. It was very helpful. Thank you for the public for coming down today. We're going to move on to agenda item number three. Uh, you need to come on up if you want to address real quick. Was that 10 feet from the property line or 10 feet from the sidewalk? 10 feet from the sidewalk or 10 feet from the property line? I intended 10 feet from the PL. Mr. Jimenez, do you have a particular preference either way? Since we're dealing with the variance and setbacks, I would suggest that we determine it from a setback from the property line. So I would leave it up to you whether you decide okay. on 10 or 8. All righty. Uh, the variance is approved for 8 foot encroaching up to 8 feet, so an 8 foot setback from the property line. Okay. Thank you. All righty. So again, uh, item number 2 is approved. The variance um, is not an 18 foot reduction, uh, but a 12 foot reduction. Okay, item number three. This is a request to approve a use permit to allow resale items for Habitat for Humanity Restore, case PL 180004. It's located at 3210 South McClintock Drive. The applicant is Lane Stume of Habitat for Humanity. Pardons for the name pronunciation errors. Mr. Jimenez, how about a staff report? Good evening, once again, Lee Jimenez, senior planner with the community division. Uh, department. Habitat for Humanity Restore is proposing to operate a building materials thrift store and retail space previously occupied by an office supply retailer at the South Palm Shopping Center 
located on the northwest corner of South McClintock Drive and East Southern Avenue within the PCC2 Planned Commercial Center General District. The applicant, Lane Stummy, explains that the thrift store will sell new and used building materials and home furnishings as means to raise extra funds to support the mission for Habitat for Humanity in Central Arizona. Today, one phone call and support uh, was received and one uh, email inquiry has been received by staff. The inquiry expressed concern uh, for after hours donation collections at the rear of the building. Noise had been an issue for another donation facility that previously operated uh, or is currently operating at that um, shopping center. Based on the information provided by the applicant, the public input received and the analysis provided in the staff report, staff supports this request and believes that the application meets the required criteria and will conform to the conditions provided in the staff report. Very good. So, Mr. Jimenez, the, we talked about this a little bit in the study session. Goodwill has been there a long time and has moved from one end of the center basically down to the other That's end of the center and has operated um, as far as staff is, in, is aware of uh, pretty smoothly in that location to date as far as information you have available. That's correct. Is that fair to say? Okay. And I've got 11 conditions for approval. Okay. That's correct. All right. That's, that's it for the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is the applicant here or the representative? Welcome. Hello, Lane Stummy with Habitat for Humanity. I live in Phoenix. Great. Any information you want to present today or any questions you I, have? I have no questions unless there are questions that I can help answer. I got at least one for you. Okay. Uh, there, as I mentioned to Lee, there's 11 conditions of approval. Have you seen those conditions? Uh, understand them? Have any questions about them? I don't know if I've seen uh, and we can give you a copy and give you a minute to review them if you like. Um, and I can do a couple other things while you do that. So you're just, you may take your time and review it. No, I've not seen this. Okay. If you want to sit and look at them, you're yes. welcome to do that. While you do that, I'll see if there's anybody who wants to speak on the case. And then I'll ask you back up, okay? Great. All right, we're on agenda item three. This is a, a use permit for resale item to allow resale at Habitat for Humanity Restore. Anyone in the audience wants to speak on agenda item number three? Okay, uh, Mr. Jimenez, uh, we had, could you just give me a brief review of the public input to date on this case while we're um, giving Mr. Stum a minute? Um, I received a phone call um, from a, a neighbor to the rear of the shopping center wherein he was um, concerned of noise and after hour donations um, that may occur at the site um, since you know no one would be um, present as far as employees go uh, during after hours uh, because he had previously had an issue with uh, the, the other donation uh, facility at the same shopping center. Um, but Things were cleaned up and he hasn't had any issues. He just wanted to bring that concern to light um, in case there was any way we can mitigate uh, any impacts created by this uh, proposed use. Got it. Okay. And that was included in the, that's the one included in the, in the packet. That's correct, hearing officer. I didn't ask this either in the study session. Um, is there a back of house aspect to this or is the rear of the building to be used? for donation drop-off uh, for this user? Is that part of the plan yeah. as, as intended? Uh, typically, the donation area is at the rear. Um, however, I'd, I'd like to uh, let the applicant speak okay. on behalf of that okay, I'll and explain you. where donations will be collected. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Okay, come on back up. How'd you do? I, the, the 11 <laughs> conditions here, I think, were all things that we had anticipated. So okay. I don't believe any of them are a challenge or troublesome. Okay. Um, so your donations are, do come to the rear of the building? Yeah, Is in that fact, correct? we noted that in the, the letter that came in with the use permit, that the truck courtyard in the back would be used for both uh, donation drop-off as well as delivery of donated items by our own trucks as well as purchased um, okay. items that we have delivered. 
And do you have any plan or how that area is policed or uh, maintained? Are there hours for donations? And what do you um, do with after hours? We've donations? proposed um, operating hours between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, currently, we operate our other stores between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., so we are looking at expansion of hours mm -hmm. and have included that here. Um, appropriate signage will have to be included in the back, explicitly telling people not to leave things. There will be security uh, cameras, although those don't stop people. They just show us pictures afterwards. Okay. And then the back area is lit uh, currently. And Mr. Jimenez, typically the security plan address that uh, for this type of use in terms of surveillance and signage? Or is that a condition we need to add or do you feel it's adequately addressed? For the proposed use, security plans aren't required um, according to the land use table and the zoning and development code. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think that would be the opinion of uh, Tempe Police Crime Prevention Unit in order to determine if one is required but they're typically not required for this proposed type of use. Okay, and I see it's required to have illumination in the back. Um, so that's a lit area. That's correct. I was just uh, addressing that it'd be properly lit according to the zoning uh, lighting requirements. Gotcha. Thank you very much, Mr. Jimenez. Um, also, sometimes things that tend to happen are donations can accumulate or be stored in outdoors in the rear and you understand that's not permitted. They have to be brought in. They can't be stored out back. And you deal with things like building materials too, right? Yes. Uh, so those have to come inside unless there's, I don't know if a permit can be gained for outdoor storage, but as presented today, that's not a permitted aspect of this. Um, although I know things can tend to accumulate, so it's kind of a maintenance challenge. Do you have any questions or anything else you wanted to present I today? I no questions. Okay, thanks for being here, appreciate it. And I'll go one more time. Anyone in the audience wanted to speak on agenda item number three? Not seeing anyone. This is a repress request for a, a use permit uh, to permit resale items for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, the re uh, request for use permit is approved based on the following criteria, that no significant increase in vehicular or pedestrian traffic will be presented with this use that we wouldn't expect in this type of retail center and in this zoning district uh, that nuisance from odor dust gas noise vibration or smoke is not expected uh, from this type of resale use and that criteria is satisfied contribution to the deterioration of the neighborhood next case, next case? okay thanks um, downgrading of property values generally you know this center is a little bit of a distress with a lot of vacant spaces and to put a, a rent paying user in there um, who seems intent upon managing the space um, adequately, I think is a positive, not a negative. So I like to see that this does not contribute to deterioration, but quite the opposite is an investment um, in this center, which is a good thing for the city. Number four, compatibility with existing surrounding structures. There's no new construction here. This use will be indoor, as we've just discussed in our deliberation today and adequate control of disruptive behavior inside and outside. Uh, the use as presented as a resale store uh, would not be normally associated with any disruptive behavior whatsoever. As such, the request for use permit is approved, subject to the 11 conditions in the staff report, and good luck with your project. Okay, moving on, agenda item number four. Request approval of a use permit to allow entertainment, uh, indoor entertainment, uh, and a use permit to allow Series 6 bar for 5th Street Prepared Food Market and Bar. This is case PL180006. It's located at 24 West 5th Street, and the applicant is Charles Hulmantel of Hulmantel and Affiliates. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, staff report. Good evening. Once again, Lee Jimenez, Senior Planner uh, with the Community Development Department. 5th Street Prepared Food Market and Bar is requesting a use permit to allow a restaurant with a full service bar and entertainment indoor in the Barmeyer building located on the northeast corner of West 5th Street and South Maple Avenue in the CC City Center District and within the TOD Transportation Overlay District. The restaurant and bar will provide a market style establishment with a large kitchen serving fast casual meals on weekdays with a full um, breakfast slash brunch offered on weekends. 
The establishment anticipates employing around 60 to 75 persons. The original use permit for a bar uh, was heard and approved by the DRC on June 13, 2017. The scope of the permit included a wraparound outdoor patio within the landscape areas along the intersection of Maple Avenue and Fifth Street. The applicant has since modified the plans to remove this patio area and replace it with screened outdoor storage and landscaping. All proposed site and elevation modifications have not been approved but are currently under review per uh, a concurrent development plan review application. All modifications will be evaluated uh, by staff to ensure conformance with the use permits uh, should both be approved. A security plan uh, is required for both use permits through the Tempe Police Crime Prevention Unit. And to date, two inquiries were received from two condo owners uh, at the Hayden Square condominiums, which is located to the west of the site. The second inquire, the first inquirer noted unhappiness with the application, but did not provide specific concerns. The second inquirer requested more information where staff provided uh, the link to the staff report uh, and also provided um, a link to the noise chapter of the city code um, that was requested by the same inquirer. And based on the information provided by the applicant, the public input received, and the analysis provided in the staff report, staff supports this request and believes that the application meets the required criteria and will conform to the conditions provided in the staff report. Excellent. Okay. Uh, a couple things. So all the entertainment is indoor per the caption I read. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct, hearing officer. Um, and I'll ask the applicant to expand maybe a little on this question. Um, is there entertainment that you're aware of on the second floor? This is a two-story operation. That's correct? correct. The scope of the use permit for the live entertainment and the bar also includes the second level. Okay, which is so we could closed. expect second floor. And there's, are there any outdoor balconies, patios, second floor? Not that I'm aware of on the second floor. It's fully enclosed. Okay. I didn't see any, but okay. I think that's it for now. I may have some more later. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Is the applicant here or the representative? Yes. Charles Welcome. Jimenez. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, Mr. Jimenez always does a complete job, and I've got a presentation, and I know there are some folks here to speak as well. Probably short my presentation a bit, address some of the issues that you've mentioned. Thank you. And then uh, respond after the folks speak. Stalling just for a moment until the presentation comes up. And while we're waiting, um, so there's been communication with you about the nature of the concerns from the property or the property of the West. Yes. Um, okay, so you're aware of those concerns and maybe uh, you can speak to those. I can. We, we, have, uh, we always make an effort to speak to people. As you know, this is the second use permit. There's already a use permit in place. It's adding the second floor that brings the use permit back and also the request for live entertainment. Thank you. Uh, again, you've, you've had quite the uh, briefing already, and I have to use the mouse right side up. You know the site. The site's a, a particularly interesting old building. I've never seen a building built quite like it. It was built for some other purpose, at least a telecommunications purpose, but it has a design that, that we think is interesting, but it, it's also of very significant construction. Only military buildings are generally built this close, this strong. It does look like a fortress a little bit. It, it, it is incredible. You could not drive a it car wasn't a if bank. you wanted to. It, seems it, was, like it was a, a bank. telecommunications facility and it had other, some other utility purposes. My guess is that at a different age, telecommunications were the only way of communication. And I think that when they had a central hub, they spent a lot of money making sure that it was fortified because that would be the thing you would attack. It wouldn't be the case today, and it hasn't been that for a long time. In fact, it spent most of its last several decades as a head shop. The location that we're looking for, use permit for live entertainment in a bar is, is close to lots of other places. The closest one is owned by the city of Tempe, which is actually both outside and does live entertainment and operates often as a bar. Uh, as you've mentioned, uh, this building is, um, built in a very unique way that does not have an opening on the second floor. So the second floor is an area where we plan to do the live entertainment, but it is not like other buildings. It is incredibly strong. Now, we're going to try to beautify it a little bit and make it a little more pedestrian oriented. These walls are 16 inches thick. They're, they're not walls that have two walls with space in it, as you sometimes find. These are, this is a 16 inch 
thick wall. It's very hard to do something inside that you'd hear outside. There are no operating windows, although one of the things that we're committed to doing is changing the glass in those windows to a better glass, to a higher quality glass that has better sound attenuation. And we've also done sound testing to make sure that what happens inside that second floor can't be heard outside that second floor. In other words, if you're listening to music inside, you'll notice that it's quite wonderful. If you're outside, you won't hear it. Again, that speaks in contrast to the things north of us, which include the city's designed outdoor entertainment for live music and the amphitheater that was built as part of Hayden Square, which includes not only a number of bars, but an actual outdoor amphitheater. And that was built as part of the original Hayden Square project. I kind of skipped through some of these. I think you largely get the point. And these are things we've already submitted. The use permit the criteria, the granting use permit, shall not cause any significant vehicular or pedestrian traffic in adjacent areas. The granting this use permit will not cause any nuisance, odor, dust, gas, noise, vibration, smoke, or heat. And granting this use permit will not contribute to the deterioration of the neighborhood. All conditions you're very familiar with. We're arguing in this case that uh, the use that we're providing is comparable to what already happens. In fact, I, I think that uh, Mill Avenue has become, for many years, what it is today. Uh, Scott Price, who's <coughs> sitting behind me, owns a number of restaurants on in the Mill Avenue area, and he's familiar with, with how to operate them. And I think you'll find, in fact, even in the last hearing, one of the things you found was that the police respected the way he's operated his establishments. It may not be the case for every bar and restaurant, but that's why each one asks for its own use permit. Every bar and restaurant should be treated based on the building that it's in and the person that runs it. The thick construction will limit everything that happens in this building. It, it, in a way that almost no building can offer, limits the sound and the dust and the odors and anything that would be inside that building stays inside that building. Again, uh, we also believe that uh, Hayden Square was, in fact, the first really mixed-use project in downtown Tempe. It was residential, it was office, and it was restaurant space. Those are the kinds of uses you'd find in this area. I'll uh, answer the questions that you've just asked uh, if I haven't already. Specifically, the second floor doesn't have any way to let sound out. There aren't patios, there aren't opening windows. The windows that are there will be replaced. I think you asked a second question as well, and I'm not sure what it was now. Uh, regarding patios or balconies on the second floor? There are no floor. patios or balconies. There's no way out on the second floor. And in fact, the patio that we did have on the west side, uh, and I think it was approved for our, our bar permit, we've removed since at the request of the neighbors. We agreed that it was probably not the best use. We've tried to be conscientious neighbors. Uh, again, they're, they're across the street from us, which is further than uh, some of the complaints that they have. But we, we still know that we're in the area and we're trying to be good neighbors. OK, question. Um, so on the patio we're going to do on the southeast side that you're proposing, um, we're going to have a new doorway, new windows, new openings in the building. Right. Uh, can you kind of show where those would be on a, on a floor plan or a site plan? And if there's any other, any other, are we changing out other windows as well um, or openings? So on, we're going to change all the windows that, on, the, on the west side. Go to a floor plan. Sorry for that delay. So the upstairs. Um, area, we're changing the windows because we're going to have entertainment uses there. We'll have a bar and we'll have indoor music. On the ground floor, the area that's along the west side, which is Maple, the area that I think we're most concerned about, we're not, change, we're not planning to change those windows because we don't have active uses. That's where the kitchen is. And so the windows that are there should be sufficient. The spaces that we've opened, by the way, take up parking spaces which are oftentimes louder than pedestrian uses. Parking areas 
you hear horns, alarms, car doors slamming, people talking when they're doing other things, getting prepared to leave. So the openings that we've created are on the other side of the residential area. Essentially on the east elevation. That's correct. Okay. And specifically, the, the existing building today has entrances that are on the south side of the building, but that open east and west. And one of the things we did was remove that location to move things further to the east. So we've already tried to address some of those concerns. Okay. In other words, the, the building operates better now than the last time we were here for a use permit, if you're a neighbor. Okay, got it. And uh, just to confirm in terms of the windows on the second floor? Yes. Any of those being changed out? And I apologize if you said that. Yes, the day. windows on the west side of the second floor, which are the ones that would face towards residents, will be replaced with a, a dual pane window to provide greater sound attenuation. Okay, and this is, I'm looking at the west elevation in your package. Is that the new windows that are showing in that elevation? Then? They'll look the same. You wouldn't notice them from, from the exterior. Uh, that was it right there, one back, maple elevation. Those, those three, I guess that's it. Yes, those it? are the three. They're not big windows. They're, they're not particularly helpful windows for being windows, but they're there, and we recognize that they were potentially a problem, so we had already committed to reglazing them. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for the additional information. It's helpful. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Mike. Um, if you got if, anything else, let if, me know. Just one thing. Yeah. We think that they're better as windows. But if, if they're problematic as a window and staff is okay on the DPR, Scott has just told me that he'd be willing to make them something other than a window if you thought that provided greater sound, sound attenuation. It's on the second floor. They don't need to be there from the, from the purposes of the second floor. People don't need to see out. We think they look nice to be able to see that from a street elevation, but if, if shutting them off made people happier, we would leave the same appearance on the outside, but shut those windows off. They can't, again, they don't operate. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that information. And there's no other, there's no doors or other windows on the west elevation. Correct. As, as I understand it. Okay. Correct. And 16 inch thick concrete. Excellent. Thank you for the information. Um, okay. I do have at least one speaker card, and there may be other folks uh, who would like to speak on this case. So let's hear from the public. Uh, Bryce uh, Buchanan, maybe? I apologize for messing up your name. Come on up. And thank you, Mr. Gilmantle. I may need to ask you back up for further questions. I'm not going far. Definitely okay. ready to answer questions and respond. Thank you, sir. Hey, Mr. Williams. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Yeah, good evening to you. Um, I'm a resident at Hayden Square. I'm a condo owner there. My condo faces uh, the west side of where this new concept will be coming into play. And um, I'm also a licensed real estate agent in Arizona. And I personally speak to a different amount of owners in Hayden Square who have um, been in contact with me in regards to what this new venue is that is coming to Tempe right across from our development. And I was just uh, expressing that given uh, everything that Charles just said in regards to the 16 inch thick walls, um, the layout of it, that I think that it would be a positive impact for our community. And um, I, I have expressed that view to different owners and we have talked uh, about different ways in regards to um, how this could make an impact for the current units that we have at Hayden Square and drive organic traffic to the development that we currently have. Um, I'm all in favor for the development, and I think it's good for what's currently happening with Mill Avenue and the growth with the uh, music, art, and culinary scene that is happening in Tempe. Very good. Thanks for the information. Thank you. Uh, so you live across, just to, whole, just to ask, you live across Maple Street, mm -hmm. and you front on Maple? My patio faces the venue directly. OK, and you live there? Mm -hmm. OK, thanks for being here today. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. I've got a couple more speaker cards. The next one I've got is Mark Davis. Welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, so with me is uh, Michael Mueller, and I'll let him introduce himself real quick. He just did. Did. No, tell you. Um, I'm on the board of Hayden Square uh, Condominiums. Um, oh, I've been there. a resident for about so almost 30 years um, and served as president in every other position on the board over the last 25 years at least. Okay, and I've got a letter from Hayden Square Condominiums. Correct. That's correct. And uh, I, can, I can either read the letter to you, allow you some time to read the letter, um, but um, I can maybe uh, uh, tell you about myself. Um, I own a unit at Hayden Square. Bryce is, is uh, one of my uh, neighbors. I, used to, I bought the unit in 2002, and I lived there until 2006. And since then, I've rented it out as a little income property. And um, some background on me, I do real estate development work, typically infill retail work, kind of like this building where you're taking the use and you're um, reorienting it to you know, more, uh, more activated uses and so on. Um, one of the things and practices I do in, in my work is I reach out to neighboring properties and, and really engage the community and get early buy-in um, so that you avoid the conflicts that this letter is presenting in. Um, some other work I do, um, I'm on the uh, Urban Land Institute uh, uh, Arizona Technical Assistance Panel where we help communities um, uh, address uh, land use issues uh, in, in their, uh, in their ge specific geographic areas. I'm involved with uh, Phoenix, um, um, uh, Phoenix uh, Community Alliance and uh, as well as Valley Partnership. Uh, just a lot of good engaged uh, organizations out there. Um, so uh, this afternoon, our uh, Homeowners Association uh, had a meeting. At, in fact, we had to call a special meeting in order to address this on the, on the very short schedule that we were uh, notified of this uh, uh, use permit. Um, so our, our community is a, is a combination of 118 units that are a mix of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. Um, our community is a leading project of its time. Uh, it was built in the mid 1980s. It, has, uh, it was one of the reurbanization projects of Tempe. It's not your typical uh, condominium project. It, uh, it includes urban features like shared parking and community parking um, within its uh, garage that it sits on top of. And it also, uh, all the units noticeably embrace the streetscape. So we're real sensitive to what happens in the community. My unit is the furthest southeast unit in the complex. So my, my balcony looks directly out to those three little windows that you identified on that, on that elevation. Across the street. Our, uh, our board has been very active with Tempe. Uh, we, we actively supported the new Weston Hotel and the new Whole Foods um, projects. And our community is becoming more and more of homeowners uh, as we've de uh, derived on our board and less of college renters. College renters have so many other choices to go to and actual, you know, a lot of apartment complexes that have been built. Our property is becoming more uh, owners. And um, so we see these new projects uh, in Tempe as setting a tone of high quality. Um, so the proposed project and the use permits are of great concern to our 118 member unit property owners that are located less than 60 feet from our community. Our history with other bars that surround our community over the decades has allowed us to understand how to build a cooperative relationship with our community and with the operators. The first step in building a cooperative relationship is to engage a dialogue. Our community was not at the table to engage the dialogue when the applicant filed their initial use permits. The applicant did not reach out to our community and by the time we caught up with him, he was already awarded the June 2017 use permits. By the time I personally connected with him, I had missed the appeal deadline. And um, so upon receiving the public notice of the new use permits, our homeowners association asked the applicant to attend our planned monthly board meeting, which is scheduled for tomorrow, February 7th. And doing so, we asked the applicant to respectfully continue this hearing. The applicant told us, and I quote, it's not necessary to delay his hearing. In response to this applicant's refusal to delay the hearing and participate in a cooperative relationship with our community, our association held a special meeting 
of the Board of Directors afforded by our governor documents to discuss the issue and draft this letter just a few hours before this meeting. And that's why we weren't able to get it to Mr. Jimenez earlier. Our community believes that the applicant will not meet Section 6-308E, approval criteria for the use permit. The reasons for uh, the increased vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic is that the project is designed as a maximum capacity intense assembly project that will just drastically increase vehicular traffic on Maple and the alley behind the project. In fact, the project is designed to remove some of the existing on-site parking spaces and the traffic will likely overflow into our community's privileged and reserved uh, parking spaces west of Hayden Square. Based on City of Tempe's parking criteria, the amount of square feet that they're occupying, if this was in, not in the location that it is, it would be requiring more than 200 parking spaces. So you can understand that this is going to be, this is really going to congest this location where the residential meets the commercial. Nuisances arising from the emission of odor, dust, gas, vibration, noise, smoke, heat, and glare, exceeding ambient. The proposed bar is replacing a building that previously was occupied by retail and office uses. The retail and office building previously buffered excessive noise from Mill Avenue bars, and the new uses will have substantial vibrations from the amplified bass and flashing lights from the entertainment that will glare out of the windows into our homes. Mr. Davis, I need you to kind of summarize, uh, if you would. We're, I, okay. We're running a little bit long on your time. I'm willing to grant you some additional time, but need to summarize. Mr. Humanto had six minutes, but he's not a, I understand, sir. I'm just making a request for you to summarize. I understand. I'll, I'll, I'll trim it down. Um, so the biggest challenges we have that we were really touching on are, are really that as much as you try to operate a business that is just indoor entertainment, what we've learned over the years is that these doors get propped open, the garage doors roll up. And as much as we try to promise, and when you're, when you're, you're taking, um, uh, you're having uh, people uh, paying admission to come in, uh, the doors are always propped open. And that's our biggest challenge. As much as we try to you know, have a, a story where it's, it's an enclosed use, it's not enclosed. So that's been the challenge. I have personal experience with this. In 2005 and 2006, uh, there was a, a, a use um, directly across the alley from the applicant's location where it was converted from a burrito store to a bar and that site ended up calling the police eight times in order to get them to apply by the noise of the Tempe's uh, noise ordinance. So what we've experienced is we've had this problem. We never had a dialogue with the operator. So what our community did, we listed out all of our reasons of, of why we're challenged with this, but we're proactive. We made a wish list of, of ideas, of, of conditions that can maybe make this operation fit a little better to our community of, um, of conditions of approval. And the biggest challenge is that we, uh, the police department and the planning department, they are, they are overrun by this and they're not able to really respond to our issues that we have in our community. So what we find is you call the police, they come out two hours later and the police officer doesn't have the noise meter. And, or, or you have these experiences where you're not able to capture the data at that time. So one of the interesting concepts that we threw out here was, let's have the community have a noise meter to capture this data. Um, so there's, there, there's, we see that there's ways to kind of cohabitate and create a solution here. We'd love the opportunity to engage the applicant directly, and uh, we'd really encourage that. Um, and, um, but in the meantime, you have our wishes. Great, great, excellent. Um, Question two. Um, yeah. well, I understand that the timing to catch the, the nuisance that's happening it, um, can kind of have come and gone by the time they have the equipment on site. Can't really endorse deputizing citizens to, to do noise readings. Uh, that probably wouldn't work too well. But I understand the, the, the concern and the intent with that. Um, is it Mr. Mueller? Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, well, we kind of. I, Basically, like we have a, a bar next door right now that we also we're going to discuss tom at tomorrow's meetings that we're constant. I'm constantly getting feedback from residents, and they're constantly calling the police, and nothing gets done with it, which is the cabin. Um, so I know that this is a different project. There's certain 
components of this that I, I appreciate over the last, uh, for example, the patio on, on Maple, that would have been a disaster. Um, so I'm glad to see it getting moved around. But there's also some negotiation for um, basically the noise restrictions, I think, would be the biggest thing okay. for us. So in summary, gentlemen, um, I heard parking concern, noise concerns from propped open doors. Um, anything other specific to the design or the use that I should make note? Of the windows, which they said they were going to do. So... Um, I think one of the one of the issues is we want to have an opportunity to revisit the application one year after. We believe that that it holds people accountable to the promises mm -hmm. and to their operation plans. Um, you know, we have some creative language in terms of how to deal with op openings, even by posting signs next to the op openings to tell employees, please don't prop doors open. You know, things like that are just ways to communicate right. things positively so that solutions can be uh, uh, created. But we need teeth because our, what we've found is that being reactive doesn't really hold people accountable. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I may call you back up if I have further questions. Yeah, Appreciate you being here today and pulling this letter together timely. <laughs> uh, before you go, one thing, too. Uh, so your, your, your best outcome today is for a continuance. That's really what you're requesting today is how I understand it time to, to speak to the applicant to address some concerns. I mean, knowing how um, engaging our board of directors are and um, how familiar we are with, with operating and creating creative solutions with other bars, hmm? having an opportunity to meet with the applicant, with our board, and having a continuous to allow that is, I think, the, I think the path of the most successful pre-agreed upon list of conditions of approval to get to. I'm just curious, yeah. how many members of your board are there? Doesn't there are five members, five. and it was a unanimous vote. So, okay. um, I just uh, two of them teleconferenced in. So, thank you very um, much. We have had able to successfully also negotiate with uh, the, the, in fact, the cabin which we just started um, dealing with. But that goes back thirty years. I mean, we've had different levels all of the different uses. all the different uses, right? And we've, yeah. been able, we've been able every time to solve it. So, I know it's a very high activity area, yeah, yes. and a lot of it's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on agenda item number four? Come on up. Should I fill out a card first? Yeah. Well, you can speak, and then if you do the card when you're done, I'm good with that. Sounds good. Uh, I'm a resident at the condominiums. I live right across the street from where the proposed project will be. Meet your name. My name's Anthony Rice. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I support what the board says. Uh, noise is already a huge problem at the condominiums. I live right off the street. Um, off Maple, and I already have to deal with the cabin um, and the Hackett House every night, and or every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I've not been able to get sleep for the most part. Um, it's been really hard to try to get any cooperation with the bar. So, as long as uh, we can delay the process and be able to talk to this bar and make sure that they take the necessary steps to control the noise, I'll be happy with uh, adding another project to uh, to the area. So, more entertainment would be nice. Excellent. Thanks for taking the time to come today. Thanks. Um, and yeah, if you go ahead and do the card right now, it'd be great. And uh, while you're doing that, anyone else in the audience who would like to speak on agenda item number four? Okay. A lot of good input. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, a couple questions uh, in regarding uh, the parking question. Um, is, is this as presented comply with parking? Does it need park special parking approvals or exceptions or... What is your view on the parking situation for this use? Hearing Officer Williams, the site um, is parked under the downtown standard for parking, and the current site plan, as shown, is providing the required amount of parking for the proposed use. Thank you. Secondly, um, notice was mentioned, which I always am concerned about. Um, was this, could you explain for the public uh, the, um, the notification procedure and how much notice was provided and how for this type of case? We provide um, public notification per our zoning code, uh, which is we notify property owners within 600 feet of the property line and neighborhood and homeowner associations within a quarter mile of the property line. And notices are sent to the owners, property owners and associations, no more than or no less than 15 calendar days from the hearing date. Thank you, sir. 
Okay. Oh. Um, forgot to add. We also post signage at the site, um, no no less than 15 calendar days prior to the hearing, as well as we publish the agenda in the Arizona Republic, um, no no less than 15 calendar days prior to the hearing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Mr. Gilmantle. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, so I've asked about the parking uh, situation. Staff's comfortable with it. Obviously, you guys have a workable scheme. There yet remains concern from next door. Um, do you want to speak to the noise issue? Um, um, sure, I, I do, absolutely at length. Um, hopefully not too much length. So one of the things we heard was um, if it were not in the location that it is, except that it is in the location that it is, and you can't get around that. This building's exactly where it was. In fact, this building was there even before Hayden Square was there. Hayden Square is a series of buildings built on top of a garage. We're a building that's got 16 foot thick walls, 16 inches thick walls. I would argue that you're gonna hear more from the garage coming out under the sound of the garage uh, my office was for a long time across the street from Hayden Square. It was, in fact, in Hayden Square. My office isn't far from it now. And so I've heard many a late nights walking through that garage. It's pretty loud. That's, just, that's the way it is. The ambient conditions are significant. One of the things that we were asked to do is consider um, doing noise testing. And the problem with noise testing is you can't isolate out everything that already happens. You, you can't just pick the next thing you're trying to figure out. You get everything. The lodge, uh, excuse me, the cabin, I've heard from Mr. Mueller this morning, this afternoon, has been a significant issue for them. I'm sure that it is. It's a building that has a completely open exterior. It has open patios, outdoor patios on the first, second, and third floor, and patios on the north, south, and east side. It's a completely different building. In fact, that building was designed in such a way to have terraces that looked over the amphitheater that was built to be an outdoor amphitheater when Hayden Square was built. We instead have a building that there are no doors on the second floor that can be propped open. Those doors into the second floor are in a fire uh, staircase. In other words, a, a, the stairs are inside the building in such a way that separate itself for fire purposes. They're also, also 16 inches thick. The only thing that's potentially there are those three windows. Those three windows are not operable. They will not become operable, so you couldn't prop them open. And we would be happy to, to leave the window there, uh, leave a bit of a space for air, and put some kind of insulation over on top of it rather than replace the window. Um, we, we replaced the window because we thought that would be the thing that would be effective. If, if the thing is different, we're open to considering something else here today. The uh, so the stairs that go from the north elevation up to upstairs, yes, those would be those remain, those are functional. That's an entrance, would be an entrance for uh patrons, yes. So there'd be an emergency exit on the far northeastern side, but the two existing will be used for regular patrons, not for emergencies, and those are completely in, inside. Okay, because I don't see any doors on the north elevation, unless I'm missing them, uh, staff. Uh, so obviously these guys would like to meet with you. Are you willing to meet with them? Well, if I give you two weeks to do it and come back in two weeks? We would ask to, uh, not to do that, and let me explain why. Um, it's good to live in a community where people care. It's good to live in a downtown where people care, and obviously they do. Um, I, sometimes people don't remember the situation correctly. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time. In fact, I, I did speak with Mark before the last hearing, so it's, I, I don't know how to respond to a concern like that when the question is, we haven't, we haven't discussed it at all. And in fact, we met before the last hearing. We didn't meet, we had a phone conversation, and I know Scott had conversations as well. But after that last hearing, even though we were granted a use permit, we went back and tried to solve things. 
we were, here was this June, July 20th request. That we relocate the patio on Maple to Fifth Street. We did that. Frame in the patio closest to Maple with trellis and landscaping. No amplified music facing Maple. Limit amplified music patio levels to a lower level Sunday through Thursday. Good neighbor signage on the patio area closest to Hayden Square. Provide gift cards to neighbors who might be impacted by the construction noise. Reach out to three to neighbors three to six most months post opening for the feedback. Those were specifically his requests last time. We did relocate the patio. We did frame in the trellis. We don't have amplified music facing Maple. We limited amplifying music patio levels to a lower level on Sundays through Thursday evenings. We are doing the good the neighbor signage. And of course, we can't reach out for three to six months until after opening until we've opened. Well, we also have had pretty significant contact with the neighbors, and it's troubling to make it sound as if we haven't. This is a timeline of our contact. So I don't, I don't know what more we can do. I don't think that more time would necessarily be helpful. We don't believe there's really a parking problem. We don't really believe there's a sound problem. And we'll be continuing to work with neighbors on a good faith basis anyway. And it's not just us hoping that that happens. Mr. Jimenez has added conditions in that do add teeth, that do provide that. I'm a little uncomfortable that the real problem seems to be the cabin. And I don't doubt that they have legitimate concerns about the cabin. In fact, I think Hayden Square is on record through its various entities of having a problem with almost every bar that's been in that location. You know, it's much closer than we are. It's garbage is much closer than we are. And I might add that the trash that neighbors speak of, um, if I could just use the overhead for one second. The trash for the cabin is this red area. The trash for the city, which also does live entertainment in a bar, is in this yellow area. And the trash for us is in the blue area. Again, um, the, the cabin is almost immediately adjacent to the residential. It was designed that way. It was built by one owner. It was built to be that. But nevertheless, it's caused problems. The city has an open patio with sound, live music, a bar. We instead have. Uh, also across the street, as the city is, a much further location that's not outdoors. We've really screened everything on the outdoors is much further away. The city doesn't really have anything blocking itself from the HOA. So we think that what we've presented has solved the issues that have been discussed. And I honestly don't think that more time would change those things. I, can, I appreciate your position. Uh, there are nine conditions of approval listed in the staff report. Uh, are you familiar with those, seen those, or have any questions relating to those? We are familiar with them. We've reviewed them, and they're fine to us. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate the uh, response. Staff, do you have anything additional you want to add at this time? Hearing Officer Williams, uh, given the concerns presented, um, we do have a standard condition that we can add where a compliance review um, can be um, scheduled within six months of operating. Um, so that's a suggestion. Uh, and if necessary, I can probably pull up, pull up the language that we can read it into the record and, and include it as a condition of approval, if, should that be what um, you'd like to decide on. That does address my interest. Is that six month time period a pretty much a standard time frame? That when we put this condition, we use six months? That's okay. correct, but you know, it's open for Okay. Modifications should you choose to do so. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Um, as always, we're most concerned with impacts to neighbors and neighborhoods uh, when new uses come in. Uh, this certainly is a downtown setting um, with a lot of activity and a lot of noise. Uh, I'm very much appreciative uh, that the board took the time to, to gather, meet, and provide uh, written input because that is helpful. And I've had enough time to digest it, maybe 70, 80 percent, to be honest with you, not completely, uh, but certainly understand the nature of your concerns 
um, relating to parking noise and, and the use in general. Um, I do have a recommendation from staff for approval. Um, I am in agreement with it. Um, I appreciate the information on prior communication that you provided uh, that it was not privy to. Um, and that's something I always wanted to provide in these processes. It sounds like um, the neighbors are pretty um, experienced, for better or worse, in working with uh, adjacent uses and dealing with some negative impacts. And what I want to do is make sure you have the opportunity to do that and you have a voice going forward. I am going to approve this this evening, but with the condition that it has a six-month review, so you'll have another opportunity to have a voice in this use, and hopefully it'll be a good neighbor. I have no reason to believe they won't, uh, but it doesn't always work out the way we envision. Uh, so having said that, this request for use permit is approved, subject to the nine conditions in the staff report, plus an additional 10th condition relating to compliance review. Do you want to read that in the record, or do we have that adequately in the record at this point? Hearing Officer Williams, I can read it into the record, so we can add please? this to the, um, as the 10th condition of approval. Please. So um, the following is a condition that should be added. Uh, return to the hearing officer for a review of compliance with conditions of approval within six months. The timing for the six month review period to commence begins when the business is in full operation. Advise community development staff when, uh, when in full business operation. If the full business activity is not initiated within one year, the use permit will lapse. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Um, with the use permit, there are some criteria, and in my opinion, those criteria are adequately satisfied. They're not perfect, um, but I think they're adequately satisfied in terms of significant increase in vehicular pedestrian traffic. Uh, this is already set up as a, an entertainment use. This is an entertainment district. Certainly, it abuts residential uses, and they are sensitive. Uh, I'm sure we'll put some parking pressure on the adjacent areas, but what we're really looking here is non-vehicular traffic, vehicular, bike, and other, and transit use uh, for this type of building, and that's why the code requirements are not super, uh, uh, they were not asking for a lot of parking spaces. Um, it doesn't want to encourage a large parking lot in this location, and I don't think any of us would like to see that either. So I think that the vehicular and pedestrian traffic is normal to what I would expect at this use at this building. Um, and in this part of the city. Nuisance from odor, dust, gas, noise, vibration. Uh, as presented, it should be contained. I do understand that these operations tend to prop doors open. Been there, seen it, heard it. Uh, because of that, we've added a condition. Uh, if it's not operated in that manner, to be able to come back and talk about that. Uh, I do want to urge the public to be vigilant, to call the T TPD, and have those calls on record. So if we come back, we can say we did contact, and here are the dates, and there should be a police record of that. Uh, if, in fact, those calls get made. We don't take it lightly, um, but I'd like to see this move forward, um, given the information I have today. Um, I have criteria number three, deterioration of the neighborhood. We want to see investment. We want to see vacant buildings used. And this is an investment uh, in the core of our downtown uh, and, and that does not a deterioration, in my opinion, uh, but in addition to a positive addition to the immediate neighborhood. Uh, compatibility with existing surrounding uses, you know, that's the big one here is can this operate compatibil compatibly uh, with, a, with a residential across the street? Um, the applicants presented certain means in terms of ingress, egress, uh, the design of the building uh, that support that this would be uh, compatible. Uh, again, we can talk about that in six months if it turns after they open in six months to see if that, in fact, is the case. But I believe it will be compatible and consistent with other uses as you move east toward Mill Avenue. And finally, adequate control of disruptive behavior inside and outside. Uh, there's is always potential for this with this type of nightclub use. Um, having the activity of the outdoor on the east side and the in ingress egress over there, uh, I think can minimize disruption to folks to the west and the south. And I think that's the best plan we can do with this building. Um, again, it's really up to the operator and the quality of the operation and the training of the staff, uh, how well they handle those issues that are inevitable, uh, but how they're managed is, is critical in keeping the use permit once it's issued. 
So again, um, this permit is approved subject to now 10 conditions. I wish you luck with the project and I encourage the neighbors to stay involved. Thank and you. thank you all for your time today. We will move on to agenda item number five. And this is a request to approve a variance uh, to reduce the use separation from a tobacco retailer to an elementary or secondary school and a use permit to allow tobacco retailer or vape shop for Blue Dragon Vapor, PL170384, located at 6473 South, excuse me, Rural Road. Applicants Tracy Moore and David Barno. Uh, Mr. Jimenez. Good evening. Once again, Lee Jimenez, senior planner with the uh, Community Development Department. Blue Dragon Vapor operates in the shopping plaza located on the southeast corner of East Waterloo Road and South Rural Road within the PCC1 Planned Commercial Center Neighborhood District. The applicants, Tracy Moore and David Barno, are seeking relief from the use permit separate from the use separation requirements, excuse me, for tobacco retailers. Tobacco retailers should not be located on a lot within 1,320 feet measured by a straight line in any direction from the lot line of a charter school, private school, or public school, which provides elementary or secondary education. The vape shop is sited on a lot located approximately 210 feet from the Stenming Lutheran School and 1,400 feet from Marcos Denisa High School. Contingent upon approval of the variance request, the applicants are also requesting a use permit to allow a tobacco retailer. A neighborhood meeting was held at Blue Dragon Vapor on Monday, December 18th at 5 p.m. The applicant, Tracy Moore, and staff attended, attended the meeting. Uh, no one from the neighborhood attended. To date, staff has received two phone calls in opposition to the variance request. Uh, one of the phone calls also shared an email that was provided to you at study session. And they have uh, both cited that it's not fitting in the area, uh, considering how close it is to schools, and also the volume of high school students who frequent the coffee establishment within the same shopping center. Based on the information provided by the applicant, the public input received, and the analysis provided in the staff report, staff does not support the variance request and believes that the application does not meet any of the required criteria for a variance. And without the variance, staff cannot support the use permit request. Nonetheless, should affirmative action be taken on the variance and use permit requests, the conditions of approval provided in the staff report shall apply, but may be amended by the hearing officer. And I'll be available should you have any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jimenez. Is the applicant, oh, I want to, before we get to the applicant, enter into the record, I do have an email um, it's from a concerned neighbor. Uh, it is objecting to the approval of the request. So I want to get that in the record. It's about a page long email. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Okay, the applicant or the representative, come on up and welcome. Um, and you're welcome to uh, present any information that you have, ask questions. This is your time. Hello, Mr. Williams. My name is Tracy Moore. I am one of the owners of the Dragon Vapor. Um, I'm going to leave that. In a minute. Um, I'd like to explain to you that in 2015, when I attempted to get my license, um, I went to the city to ask them what I needed. I said, they said, you need this, 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 and this. I filled it out. I paid my fees. A couple weeks later, received our license in the mail. And on May 1st, 2015, we opened our doors. We didn't have any issues until five months later in September when we received a letter stating that we were in non-compliance. Because we didn't know. Because we didn't know, obviously, that I thought I had filled everything out that they had requested of me and we received our license. Um, so five months later in September, we received um, actually a visit <laughs> and a letter um, from a city official stating that we were in non-compliance, we needed to get a use permit. So um, after back and forth, um, we actually had the manager, city, um, the city manager, Dave Nakamura, come to our store and visit us and us explain to them what we do. We are not a tobacco shop by any means. We are a vape shop and we are getting people off of tobacco. We are not in any sense selling anything related to tobacco. Most of our products are electronics and vape flavors, juice that people use to get off of nicotine and to get off of cigarettes. He came to our store and he actually canceled our use permit hearing on the basis of we do not sell tobacco products. 
Um, that being said, we had already paid our fees. We had already filled out the application. We had done everything that they had asked us to do, and the city manager canceled our hearing. At that point, we thought everything was all fine and dandy, and in September of this 2017, not this year, 2017, we now received a phone call from Steve Abrahamson stating, did you receive my letter of noncompliance? Uh, no, not another one, and he said yes. You're in, you still do not have a use permit. Well, apparently the city manager did not complete the city permit, even though they currently had the funds that we were required to, to pay and all the paperwork that they said that we needed. So this is why we're here today, <laughs> to explain to you that now we are have been in business for three years in April. Um, we have 200 customers a day. More than 200 customers a day. More than 200 Nobody customers a day. We have about 6186 per month. This is just based off of January. Um, we have a net sales of $172,000, and we pay the city $3,107 of revenue every month. So if that doesn't increase this year, your guys' revenue from us will be $37,000 plus um, based off of our shop. We do not sell to anybody under the age of 18. We sell to 18-year-olds to 100-year-old people. We have saved and helped so many people. This is a positive aspect in what we do. This is helping people. This is not a hindrance. This is not allowing high schoolers or underage people to come to our store. Now, if you will look at the, um, the map that they have given us. Oh, sorry. Do I turn it upside down? Or? It'll, It'll come up. up. Thank you, sir. So Marcus Deniza is uh, way past here. Okay. And this is the line of our, our property line, correct? This is a liquor store here. So this property line here. Our store is over here. Right. And there's also a Circle K in the front. He has a better one. That's, that's it's much better. Thank there. you. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, sir. But now yeah, it's not you, going on, and I have to find it. <laughs> Here's what it's, it's a blue parcel. Oh, okay. it kind of well, it uh, makes it harder. But it's lower. Yeah. So if you can see right here, this is where Marco Sinisa is located. Mm -hmm. This is their parking. We're over here in the blue. Right here is a liquor store that sells actual tobacco products, uh, firearms, and liquor. In the same corner is a Circle K that sells tobacco products, vape products, and liquor. Right here is Albertsons that does the same thing. Now, if Marco Sinisa is right here, if you go to McClintock and Baseline, you have Walgreens that sells vape products, uh, tobacco products, alcohol, you have fries, you have Circle K, you have everything that's going against. And I understand some are grandfathered in, some are not, because Marco Sinisa was built and established in 1971, but that's neither here nor there. Um, our argument today, sir, is that we're put under a category as in the tobacco industry, which we should, which we are not because a tobacco industry is someone who sells tobacco. We sell zero tobacco whatsoever. Um, if anything, we would be put under electronic uh, device. device and anything. I also, I brought one with me today as well. I do know that, you know, we did do the public hearing and as um, the gentleman stated, nobody did show up from the neighborhood. It might have been they just were busy, they were at work, they didn't have the opportunity, which is understandable. Can I finish? Oh, go ahead, sir. And then, and then I'll let him continue. Um, I just wanted to state that we do have, we did submit two letters um, from people that have been helped um, by vaping um, that should be in your file. I have them. Um, yes. And then also how we employ 16 um, employees at this location itself. Um, which means obviously 16 families that are being employed. Um, we, um, I'm sorry, that we um, are trying to make a positive effect in the city of Tempe. Yeah, and real, uh, real, uh, Go sir, I do know and I understand this is not a hearing about the science of vaping. Um, that could be a whole other hearing, and I'd be more than happy to show up for that. I do know that people in the public who do not vape or do not smoke do not understand it, automatically assume it's bad, and I fully understand when it first came out, I assumed the same thing. 
Obviously, after being in this industry for years and looking at the science behind it, I can prove otherwise, personally for my own health, because I smoked for over 20 years. Um, one of the big issues that, that the general public has is underage vaping, and I agree. I agree completely with that. Um, we did not put the store located there. It has anything to do with Marcos Deniza. If anything, it would have to do with ASU, if anything. But um, we have two signs on our front door. It says 18 years or older. We have two signs on our stands. We have a double-sided calendar. Um, we check ID for credit cards and every sales. Now, granted, the only thing I think that we could improve is maybe get a machine that can check for fake IDs. I was actually sitting there thinking, how can we improve better to help the public for kids that are coming in with fake IDs. That's one thing that we could do that we'd have no problem purchasing um, to help out in that manner. I, do I think vaping's an epidemic for high schoolers? Yes, sir, I do. I'm not, I, but at the same time, once again, this isn't the science about vaping. This is to prove that we're not there to hurt the city. We're, we're there to help the general public. We're there to show that we are not a tobacco retailer. We are strictly a vaping electronic sensation industry. That's exactly what we are. And we've been there for three years and we did everything we were supposed to do as employers or as a business owner. We were not told anything about this. And now three years later, we're standing here about to get removed from our location. Understood. I can certainly appreciate that. And the information is helpful. Um, anything else you want to present before I see if there's anyone here who wants to speak? Um, no, sir. I, okay. I appreciate your time today and the you're, city's time. You're very welcome. I appreciate the information that you provided. It is helpful. Um, before I ask, so go ahead and have a seat. I oh, may ask I do, you back up. Sure. I do actually have something because we did receive the letter that you received today. And it, there is some misinformation in there stating that we don't care if underage obviously he already told you what signage and such that we do um, we have actually kicked people out of our store finding that they were selling if they came in and said i'm selling to so and so who's under 18 they're no longer welcome in our store either and Understood. that wasn't even that location that was our glendale. that was actually our yeah our glendale right. location thank you very much uh, a couple things uh for staff mr jimenez um, so the, uh, how is vaping classified? This is, I assume, classified as tobacco under city code, or um, is there a distinction between tobacco and uh, vape products? Well, according to the zoning code, uh, under the definition section, vaping is a product categorized under tobacco retailing uh, products of sales. So it's essentially it's treated the same by our code. Tobacco and vaping are treated the same. By That's the correct. It's under that regulating. Umbrella the use and the separation standards. Right here. Uh, second, then there's, there was mention of a management intervention or some meeting with other city staff. Um, do you guys have information about that? Um, where a hearing was set and then removed or? Uh, Hearing Officer Williams, uh, two years ago there was, a, actually it was three years ago, there was a, uh, a concern uh, obviously brought up because I did not have a use permit. The, uh, the, the applicant paid for the, the use permit and there were meetings because of, of the, uh, the potential for it to be denied uh, between the applicant and the department director of community development, Dave Nakagawara not the city manager. Understood. Uh, there, there was uh, confusion as to who actually went out there. Mr. Nakagawara is no longer the director and there was no information imparted to staff at that time as to what the outcome was. And frankly, it, it got lost in time. And uh, it was determined later that they were operating still uh, and uh, the code compliance department or division indicated that uh, they needed to get a use permit. That was information that was new to us and staff. And we, at that point, I did call them and, and, and let them know that we needed to process a use permit. However, there is a, an issue with the separation. That, that's the big concern there. And uh, that's why they're here today uh, for variance. Uh, to to eliminate that separation requirement. 
Understood. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. Okay. Let's next see if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on agenda item number five. Come on down. Good evening, Mr. Williams. I have a filled out card. <clears throat> My name is Claire Lane. I'd like to give you a little history lesson. Marcos Deniza was built, I think, in 1971. I did the work to build that shopping center in roughly 78. This code provision has been, and I've been the president of the Arizona Associate of City Attorneys, and I've written codes for different cities when we brought them out of the ground. This basically separation of high school, tobacco, liquor is fairly common, okay? When that was built, when Marcos was built, there was no Circle K selling tobacco. There was no liquor store selling tobacco. There was a paint and carpet store that built over time. That's the history of that corner. Gethsemane did, in fact, have a little children's day school, and Marcos was right there from, from well, of course, Gethsemane has expanded, of course, okay? But let's talk about what happened three years ago. Three years ago, I got a call that a city employee had basically gone to the front door of this business. Now, they went into the city and applied for all the permits and got them. After they opened, an employee came by and gave them basically a cease and desist violation order. They went, whoa, wait a second. They went down, they applied for variance, and we started looking at the code. And this is something that's a national dispute right now. What in the heck is vaping? They don't even call it that in Europe or Australia, by the way. It is not tobacco. It is not an electronic cigarette. The, the original electronic cigarette looked like a cigarette, felt like a cigarette, made you think you were smoking a cigarette. But they've kind of thrown this blanket over everything from vape machines, which produce a mist. And the bottom line came down, well, what about that liquor store? And the answer that I got was, well, the Circle K doesn't substantially sell tobacco. They have soda pop and bread and all that. Liquor store doesn't substantially sell tobacco. Well, we looked at that. Less than 5% of the sales of this store involve nicotine. The primary sales are the machines that create the vapor and the colorful, or the flavorful juices people like to make vape with. Then I called the city manager's office. I got a return call from a David McAmara, and he's not the city manager. I know that. They were mistaken. But he was definitely department head. I invited him to a meeting on site at the building. We had a variance applied for, and we had a hearing pending. He walked the store with me. We sat down and looked through the various trade magazines about the vaping industry, which didn't exist when I was in college, okay? And we took him and showed him our inventory that showed a minuscule amount of nicotine. And that's usually for people wanting to quit smoking. They start here. But as far as the overall sales, it was minuscule. We also showed him the signage. Nobody under 18. It is also a social thing. There's a TV. People socialize. They have vaping contests in Europe right in front of City Hall. Who can blow the biggest bubble? I think that's kind of stupid. But we swallowed goldfish in my day, if you will, OK? And he called me back and said, it's not tobacco. Your primary business is not tobacco. You do not need a use permit. And the hearing was canceled. That's the history of this case. The question, just because somebody throws vaping in as a tobacco, does that make this use illegal? Well, you've approved it. And we do. if we need a use permit, we are here. But we have controls. These kids can get beer, liquor, and cigarettes at the Circle K or the liquor store. They came later, but the liquor store doesn't sell a lot of tobacco, okay? <clears throat> if our kids are like I was, they're going to try and get a hold of this stuff. We do everything we can to prevent it, but I don't think there's any evidence whatsoever that leads to vaping goes to smoking. It's the other way. Smoking leads to vaping leads to cessation. Because some people get that suckling thing they've got to have in their mouth, talk to some of the smoking centers. That's one of the things that you have to overcome when you quit smoking, okay? So it's really a helpful thing, if you will, okay? And I want to give you the history. We didn't think we needed one. I need you to wrap up your comments, yeah, if you will. But we don't think we needed one, but we would agree. I think they need what? It's stupid. They need a variance to sell tobacco products, but I'm sure they would agree to have a condition that they don't sell tobacco. As, as silly as that sounds, they're not going to sell any tobacco products. Does that make sense? That's, so that's the history. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on this case? Come on up. Uh, my name is Brittany Hughes, and I live in the neighborhood. 
I actually have a letter of opposition that I'd like to submit that I kind of did last minute. Um, what? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just gave it. Um, my letter of opposition is not science-based at all. It's more um, personal opinion. I come from three perspectives. One is as an educator. I've been an educator in Arizona for the past three years, and I've actually been in elementary education and have seen an increasingly growing population of students that smoke. Um, last year, we caught a 13-year-old that brought in a vape pen and was teaching nine and eight-year-olds how to smoke with it. Um, I'm not saying that that's happening in this case, but it is an issue, and I think that's something we cannot argue. Um, but I think what worries me the most is that there is statistics against vaping leading to other drugs and cigarettes. Um, and like I said, I won't, I won't bore you with uh, statistics too much, but I do know as a student from Marcos Deniza, a person that lives in the neighborhood, you have an overwhelming number of various age groups visiting Dutch Bros every day, going to Little Caesars at lunchtime, filling up their gas tanks at Circle K. And it's scary to think that our children are being exposed to something like this um, so close to where they go to school and where their parents are working. And we are surrounded right now by vape shops. We have them on almost every corner. They're becoming as common as Starbucks. So uh, I don't understand why we need one in a school area. I mean, I think we have ordinances and, and zoning laws for that exact reason. So I, I just, I don't understand why we need one in the area that close to a school. That's all I got to say. Thank, thank you very much yeah. for coming in. Okay, anyone else on agenda item number five like to speak? Come on up. My name is Sherry Toussaint, and I'm speaking in opposition to the variants. <clears throat> I, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. I am, live in the neighborhood, and I'm also an educator. There are compelling public reasons why we have these youth separation restrictions. And I, too, just don't understand. I'm not sure I see what reasons there are that would overcome those, the need for those restrictions. And um, I know that it's just it, it presents an attractive nuisance for the students who frequent that area. And there, it's not just one school. There's two schools as well. So there's quite a lot of student traffic on that corner. So, <clears throat> And, um, you know, Tempe neighborhoods are known for their schools. It creates a certain characteristic in a neighborhood that has a school. And we'd like to see that protected. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, agenda item five. My name's Terry St. Michael. I, too, live in the neighborhood. I, too, have been an educator for 36 years. I have lived in that neighborhood since 1988, and uh, I frequent that particular area. A friend of mine used to own the uh, florist shop that's around the corner from the vape. And I really had noticed a lot more um, high school. I taught at South Mountain High School, so I am particularly aware of teenage behavior. And um, there is, since Dutch Brothers has moved in, uh, the vape store is there. There is a lot more activity hanging out, not a lot going on in that particular area. And I did not have a sense of, I, I, you know, I'm being educated, which I, you know, appreciate about this whole vaping thing, but I was next door in uh, December at A.J. Taylor's, which is the store right next to, I guess it would be um, to the south, of the vape store with my 10 year old and both of us commented about the smell and that you know we didn't go in we were in the tailor shop we walked out of the tailor shop and then we walked around because we're within walking distance distance and walked home and had this conversation about what is this and why is it here and it's again it's one of those sort of unnecessary nuisances we had a variance um, and there's no reason to make a change at this point. 
Gethsemane has its elementary school, which has expanded from sort of a small daycare. Uh, Marcos Deniza High School has expanded. And as an educator for over you know, 36 years with high school students, um, I know their behavior well. And out of sight, out of mind is better than being confronted with things that they, yeah, it's like, what? yeah, I could do that. And I would prefer that they didn't. I also have a 14-year-old um, who I don't have any interest sending him over to Circle K to pick up anything because he does not need to be interacting with uh, the other teenagers hanging around. So that's from the mom perspective. Ms. St. Michael, you said yes. when you visited the store next door, you noticed an odor. Yes. Was this the odor? What was that odor? I thought of? it was, was smoke. My uh, father was a smoker. He died at 56 from lung cancer. So it's sort of a smell that I, you know, and I don't, I, I did not realize that vaping did not include tobacco. It smelled like tobacco, but, you know, again, you yeah, know, those are assumptions I make um, based on location and just walking by the front of the store. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't know how else to categorize it. It's perceived as this is something you inhale. There aren't a lot of things you inhale that aren't smoke affiliated. And I don't think there's any health benefits other than it's swell if you're a smoker and you're trying to get off of it. But okay. yeah, so I was just curious if with the odor you smelled, you weren't sure what it was, but there was an odor. Absolutely. Okay. That's that's what my question. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank, you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we're on agenda item number five. Anyone else in the audience like to speak on agenda item five? Come on up. Thank you. Welcome. Also my first time doing this and I had a letter. I'll try not to read it. But um, my name is Cindy Kaminska. And I live in the neighborhood. I've been there since 1990. I've had three uh, students that um, have gone to local high schools, a couple to Marcos, one to Corona. I have a currently one that's a teenager. And um, uh, some of the things that are being said tonight, I concur with all of them. But I can speak firsthand on behalf of a parent of a teenager who has um, been drawn into this. Um, first of all, uh, definitely, I would imagine if we look, refer to the percentage of the amount of money that's spent there, that's because those dev devices are extremely expensive, 100 and something compared to what the juices are. Um, the juices are enticing. Let's remind them they're fruity and they're candy flavored and they're called fruity pebbles and different things like that. It definitely is enticing to the youth. I'm not a 54-year-old or uh, person or 58 or when I'm in my 50s. I don't want to say my age. But, um, you know, those kinds of flavors don't entice me. So who are we trying to reach here? Certainly our young population. Um, now, this is one, one place, and we're not going to stop vaping. Okay, we know that. We know these businesses are going to be here. But, um, you know, they did touch on the fact that this particular business, and it's on their website, there's pictures of it, that shows that this is drawn to be a hangout, a social area. Kids are enticed to that. It's um, one thing when you're, you can get somebody to buy you liquor at the Circle K or the liquor store on the corner, which, by the way, are none of them that I would prefer to have either, but it is what it is. Um, but if they, um, this is something that they're going to look forward to, to doing at age 18. It's not 21, they're going to go out and drink. we got a few more years. My high schooler was 18 and halfway through a uh, teenager. So high schoolers are not there. Yes, they are. They're 18 and they're still in school and they can buy them and they can take them to school and give them to the kids. And that's what's happening. Um, they have sofas, they have bar stools, they have refrigerators with beverages. This is common in all vape shops. I'm not pointing out this one in particular. This is really common. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that it's made to be a hangout. They're from another photo on their website um, they have a view clearly of Dutch Bros that they're talking about. This is a big hangout for teens in our neighborhood area, um, and literally, it's noticed. Just, yeah, it's just a, yeah. You you always wonder if there's a concert or something going on over there sometimes, um, but literally, it is just steps away. I'm sure you've seen that if you if you've walked the property, how close that is. Um, I also want to point out that the Gethsemane School. Um, I know it hasn't shown up on a map, and I do have it, but the wall of that school is literally parallel to the property, okay? We're not talking like it's businesses away. It is right there, and it is expanding. And that is preschoolers all the way through eighth grade. Middle schoolers are our target here. 
I, f I also didn't mention, oops, do I, can I have just a little bit of Wrap up, please. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. It. I'll try to. I also work for a nonprofit who is working to reduce underage drinking and substance use. Um, I've also done a research paper having to go to college recently that has done a lot of re research on vaping because my son has been enticed with that ever since he has become a freshman in high school. And he is graduating now. Um, but it's really important to understand that for these young people who we're trying to protect with this variance are the ones who it is, vaping is a gateway to, to smoking. My son has done this. He started out with the, the it's, it's just glycerin and water and it's just flavors. Now then a little nicotine's in it, now a lot of nicotine and he's leaving family events to have to go vape because the nicotine addiction is there. And so let's not be uh, confused about this. This is why we have space environments. This is why the city council has put it in place. They also, within the past year or two, have come around to ask what is the, how to define our neighborhoods, what character do we want. The kind of character is we do not want this to be a hub of, of uh, tobacco retailers, vaping retailers, nicotine addiction places. Um, and my son has, is a, an example of that. And I ask that you please uphold the uh, city ordinance that's in place. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else on agenda item five? All righty, thank everyone for the, I thank everyone for taking their time to be here and their patience um, as the evening grows <clears throat> a little more advanced. Um, and I will, since there was so much testimony, if you guys want a minute or two to make any closing comments, I will certainly, I'll allow that. And I appreciate your patience as well. And just a, a minute or two if you could. Just, um, I just wanted to say something real fast recording, uh, regarding the dry cleaners. The lady who owns the dry cleaners actually came over today again today um, saying she wished she could be here to fight for us because she disagrees with what the city is doing and that if we want her to send any letter or statements to the city directly just to let her know, um, she has no problem for it because she absolutely has nothing against our business. Number two, it, our business does... Uh, give out a odor. It's a strawberry, it's a fruit, it's a different situations like that inside the building. Um, three, once again, if they want to get into science, I do appreciate the teachers that are here, the educators that are here. I myself went to Marco Siniza, but at the same time, your educators educate. Well, education will show that what we are doing is actually saving lives. We're the thousands, I can have thousands of people state how it has literally saved their life and got them off cigarettes. So I'm not talking about eight-year-old kids. No, we're not selling to eight-year-old kids. We're selling to people who, okay. Anyways, I'm not going to weigh in judgment ahead. on whether vaping no, is bad or not. I'm, I'll understand. let well, everybody know that. There's a, 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 a main thing here of, you know, kids are going to be led to that. My whole family all died in the ages of 50 to 59 from smoking disease, lung cancer. Lung cancer. Um, cardiopulmonary disease, all create from smoking cigarettes. And I, when my father passed away, said, number one, I'm making the decision to not do that for my own life. And so that's obviously things that children, being led by their parents, can be taught to not do that. Um, so I have never been a smoker, and I don't vape. So I am just here to help people to get off of the cigarettes and the bad things that are in our world and are going to be here regardless of whether our shop is here or not. But we're an outlet. Also, regarding our um, pricing of these products, you will save over $8,000 to $10,000 by switching from cigarettes to vaping. And our devices are a very low, low profit. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. And thanks for your patience as well. All right, you guys can grab a seat. Okay, you know, um, I certainly appreciate the altruistic aspect of it, of trying to help people go from one substance to another that may be less harmful. Uh, we don't have any um, content in our ordinance about the relative dangers of each, or do we regulate them differently? We regulate them the same, is that correct, staff, uh, with the same concerns? Um, has there been, uh, for staff, any discussion with the legal department on this case? with the city attorney or the city attorney's office as to the processing and timing and chain of events on this case. Is there any discussion or any, is there any discussion needed with the attorney's office in your opinion? No, no and no. Okay. 
thank you for that. Uh, this is a tough case because I promote business and I like to see businesses succeed and I see business owners who've invested in a business um, in some, and have expected a return um, on that investment. Um, we are not again here to weigh in on the, the values or the negative aspects of vaping versus tobacco use. That's not what's before me as hearing officer. Uh, so I will not. I will not do that. I've heard very clearly a lot of concern uh, about these substances, uh, but that, just to be clear, is not a criteria in my decision tonight. Um, I noticed too that this is, uh, case has been um, at staff's attention for a while, and they bring it, uh, and we're here now tonight because of that concern. Um, the separation uh, requirements, and I understand there are, there's a liquor store, there's maybe a vape shop or another smoke shop that actually sells tobacco right across the street, um, and that can be available to uh, minors as well as anybody. And I understand that I saw the sign on your business about uh, you don't sell to people under 18. Um, nonetheless, people under 18 are getting and obtaining these products, and the closer we have them to where the kids concentrate, the better, the more likely we are to have them. And then have, going to the property today and being there for a little while and seeing the, the queue for Dutch Brothers is amazing. Those guys have something magic going on, as far as I can tell, uh, for kids or anybody to line up that long. And the car traffic to go through the drive through is pretty crazy and probably disrupts your parking, I would imagine, as well. Uh, so we have an even more acute situation where kids are attracted right to the front of your store for other reasons. Um, and if we were outside this setback, I'd really have no opinion or no concern with this use. Uh, but my concern is that we are within the setback um, for three schools, not just one. They were all mentioned in the testimony. Um, and because of that, because this is a code issue about separation and not about the actual substances or the materials being sold, the separation issue is what's before me. And as such, um, I cannot support this and cannot approve this um, request as presented. Uh, so the request for variance uh, to reduce the setback for separation is denied. And as such, then the use permit uh, cannot be heard based on that since it doesn't meet separation requirements. Again, I appreciate uh, everyone's time and tonight. I know this is disappointing for the business owners. Um, but I believe that's the best decision based on the code and the requirements. And thank you all again for your, your patience on this case. Mr. Williams? Yes. Could you go over the, uh, the, the four tests of a variance, please? For variance? Thank you. If you here for the record? Yes. Uh, special circumstances are applicable to this property, including its size, shape, topography, or location, um, or surroundings. The applicants indicate their special circumstances or condition is that vape products are not considered tobacco and should be categorized as general retail items. This special circumstance has no, has no kin to the property size or relationship uh, to the property size, topography, location, as it relates really to this definition of tobacco or vape. Uh, number two, the strict application of the code will deprive the property owner of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the same classification. Again, this was adopted by uh, uh, ordinance of the city council establishing the use separation. And it's not just alcohol or not just tobacco uses that have separation. There are other uses in our code that require such separation. Uh, so this has been on the books uh, and all other use, or all other of these types of uses are required to comply with them. Number three, the adjustment shall not constitute a grant of special privileges. Uh, we've never gr granted something under the 1320 that I'm aware of. Uh, if it's come before me, it hasn't been approved. Uh, so to give this one now seemed like it would be a grant of special privilege. And I, I can't agree with that. Um, and number four, variance may not be granted if the special circumstances are self-imposed by the property owner. I understand there's been some confusion about what's permitted and not permitted on this, uh, in this case at this location because of the distance. Uh, but we don't see, I don't see any special circumstances applicable to the property, um, and certainly um, uh, 
it is a request of the, the business owner to want this, so it is a self-imposition. So as, as such, uh, I don't believe the criteria are met for the variance, and the request is denied. We have one more case on our agenda tonight, and that is agenda item number six. This is a request approval of a use permit to increase the maximum height, uh, which is four feet, of a freestanding wall within the front yard building setback for the Wake residence. It's located at 1940 Citation Lane. The applicant is Samantha Wake. Uh, we did have this on our agenda uh, last meeting and it's been continued to tonight. Mr. Jimenez, do we have a staff report? Once again, Lee Jimenez, senior planner with the Community Development Department. Um, as you recall, this uh, item was continued from the January 16th uh, hearing since the applicant was not present. The Wake residence is located on the northeast corner of South Feliz uh, Drive and east of, or, and east of, uh, excuse me, is, is on the northeast corner of South Los Feliz Drive and East Citation Lane uh, within the R17 single family residential district. The applicant, Samantha Wake, constructed a block wall um, fencing uh, eight inches taller than the maximum four foot height allowed within the required front yard building setback. Uh, this use permit request is a result of a code violation where the applicant was provided the option to reduce the height to a maximum of four feet or apply for a use permit uh, to exceed the maximum height. Today, staff has received one email and one letter in support and nine emails and five phone calls in opposition to the use permit request. The neighbors in support do not believe that the wall height is detrimental to the neighborhood nor an eyesore and the consensus of the neighbors in opposition cite the wall is a hazard since it blocks the view of oncoming traffic at the intersection of Los Feliz, uh, where an approval would set un unwanted precedents of a walled off neighborhood, giving a non-friendly appearance. Furthermore, um, two of the uh, tallied neighbors in opposition also spoke at the last hearing. So based on the information provided uh, by the applicant, the public input received and the analysis provided in the staff report, staff maintains support of this request and believes that the application meets the required criteria and will conform to the conditions provided in the staff report. And I'll be available should you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Just to clarify, this is a, a case of eight inches, basically. This That's wall correct. is eight inches taller than what normally be allowed. That's correct. And as indicated in the staff report, that eight inches is the equivalent of one course of block wall, of block. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, is the applicant here today? Welcome. Nice to meet you. Appreciate your patience. <laughs> uh, any information you want to present or any questions you have, this is your time. Okay, uh, I'll make this pretty quick since it's We need your late. name for the record. Too. My name is Samantha Wake. I live at 1940 East Citation Lane. Um, it's a corner lot with a lot of traffic, and I have just had my first child and wanted to create an area for her to play safely and privately without people walking by being able to interact with her. Um, we don't have much of a backyard, it's all patio. We don't have carpet in the house. It's really where we're teaching her to crawl these days. She's back there, she finally falls asleep. Um, and if you look at our lot, the house is set so far back that we just had all of this space, which was being used as a rock pile because I couldn't keep up with landscaping. Um, in short, it was just um, a dream that um, we could have this space for her and that we can keep it as it is if it's absolutely necessary and eight inches is really throwing people off, then we will comply. I appreciate that very much. And again, your patience and hello to the rest of the family. Okay, um, time for the public. If you would like to speak on this case, please feel free to come on up. Uh, this is the time. And I, so for the record, while that's happening, I do have an email uh, from Mr. Peterson <laughs> Um, regarding this case um, and he is objecting to this re approval of the use permit for the record. Okay, welcome. 
Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, Tim Sweeney. Uh, I'm a resident uh, uh, right down the street of Citation. Uh, built the house 33 years ago. So a long time resident of the neighborhood. Um, I, I guess my issue with it is, one, the, the pure aesthetics of it. We do have walled backyards. Uh, I have a backyard very similar size to that, have a swimming pool in it, and raised three children, had uh, enough room for jungle gyms and that sort of thing in addition. So there's plenty of room to, to enjoy your patio in your backyard. And uh, the objection, I think most people, from what I've read and talked to our, our neighbors, is a uh, walled front yard just just doesn't make any sense it's it's it does not uh say friendly neighborhood this has been a great neighborhood it does not have an hoa so you get you know you you have that uh, uh libertarian uh, vent to it to do things that are attractive that you want to do within city code um uh, and, and we respect that but the aesthetics of it are just are just wrong. Uh, worry about uh, uh, the visibility coming down Los uh, Feliz is a half mile street. There's a fair amount of traffic coming down there, enough so that you have a traffic light at Elliott and uh, Los Feliz. You have speed bumps to the south of there. So obviously there's traffic there. When you sit at that corner, you look to uh, north or south if you're uh, westbound on Citation, it's a visual hazard. It, it makes it tough. You have to stop, nose out, and take a second look. And at some point, somebody's not going to do that, and there will be an accident there. Um, I, I appreciate uh, this week uh, wanting a, a space, uh, and they're certainly there. Uh, but it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't uh, create a friendly atmosphere, as I've said. Also, there's something in the record about commercial. Um, I don't know what that was. I, I saw in, in uh, online uh, from the city that there's some commercial venture there too. Um, I'm not sure what the particulars are. Fitness uh, is what I, I, I read into it. So I may be mistaken on that, but if it's commercial, it's, it's an R, R17 uh, single family home. I certainly don't want a commercial venture. Yeah, just so you know, there are some home occupations that are permitted in residential <laughs> districts and uh, that's not really what's on the table this evening, just okay. so you know. I, I didn't know if the walls had something to do with that. So that's my take on it. And I got a question for you sure. then, and too. So you understand that they're allowed to have a four foot wall I out do. there. And I, we're talking I regret about, that, but yes, I do. We're talking about eight inches, right? right? And you feel that difference is, dis is distinct. Yeah, for, for uh, you. It, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, but I object to the whole thing, to be perfectly honest. I so. understand. Okay. okay. Thank you for taking thank the time you. and thank you for your patience uh, tonight. Uh, anyone else you'd like to speak on agenda item number six? Okay. If you want, you want to make a closing remark, uh, you certainly can, Ms. Wake. Not worried about any business or non things, just the wall. Traffic's okay if you want to talk about that. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to address. I pull out of that driveway and pull up to that stop sign multiple times a day. I think the issue is people try to pause at the stop sign and not give full attention to de the decision they're about to make as they're entering an intersection. I have watched people slow through that stop and pass through. Right. With that aside, I have landscaping that goes beyond the wall. So if they have a problem with the wall, then the landscaping would have to have been a problem too, and it's within code. So it's the landscaping would be blocking it I primarily noticed, before a wall. So I noticed some irrigation lines out there when I was uh, looking at the property. So there's going to be plants reinstalled on the outside of the wall. If they want us to, not at this point. Okay. So what landscaping were you referring to? Um, on the very corner, there's about there's a little pack of palm trees. Yes. That are right next to the stop sign. Okay, that's my next topic for you. Uh oh. So the staff has, if this is approved, included a condition to have those trees removed at your expense. Do you understand that? Wait, that has to happen? That would be required uh, if this is approved 
as a condition of the use permit. I was wondering if you understood that, and that's probably a significant expense. I did not understand that and believe that it's within code, so I'm kind of confused as to why it's being brought up now. It hasn't changed at all, only the wall behind it is what we're, what I thought we were discussing. Okay, I'm glad I asked you because I was wondering about that. Okay, uh, do you have any other questions or any? No. Anything? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A quick apology for not making the first one. Okay, well, you just bought some more time, so we're here anyway. Um, staff, any further comment uh, on the condition or on this case in general? Um, I only included the condition um, after speaking with traffic engineering about the landscaping with being within the clear vision triangle at that intersection. I, I do understand it's been existing that way for years. Um, I just don't, don't know at, to which point who is responsible for assuring that that clear vision triangle isn't impeded. So that is why I added or included that condition of approval uh, with this use permit. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Okay, this is a, a close case in terms of, I fully understand, I've heard from several neighbors and commenters about, you know, a walled front yard kind of changes the character of the block, it changes the feel of that immediate area, and um, that's, I certainly think it agrees, it creates some private space where there maybe wasn't. It also takes eyes, visual um, eyes off of that part of the neighborhood, and we generally like to have that for, for um, health and safety or for safety reasons. Uh, however, the code does permit a four-foot wall. So we're here tonight talking about the difference between a four-foot and a four-foot eight-inch wall. Um, I think there is a, having been on the property and watched the traffic, there is a concern when people don't obey that stop sign very well and they roll. Um, however, the trees are the bigger problem. Um, uh, probably impeding that vision. I don't think an eight inches is going to change whether you see a car coming or not um, from the north heading south. Um, again, I am sensitive to the urban design issue in the neighborhood aspect, um, uh, but I go back to kind of common sense and we're talking about uh, eight inch one course of block difference and is that significant in terms of the safety concern or the aesthetic concern, and I don't think it is, to be honest. Uh, so as such, I'm going to follow the staff recommendation for approval and approve this request for a four-foot, eight-inch wall, uh, no higher in the front yard setback. I would like to see you install some landscaping along the base of that wall uh, to help it blend in and soften it since it's close to the street. Um, I will not include the condition regarding the palm trees, but I will refer that to the city's traffic division. To bring that to their attention, uh, but would like to see you put some landscaping in the part that's in the front yard setback at least. Uh, this is a use permit request, oh, here so in order to Williams. approve it. Yes, Mr. Jimenez. Shall we add the uh, addition of the landscaping along the, the bottom as a condition of approval? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jimenez. You. Yes, for shrubs and accent plants. Okay. Thank okay. And uh, the, the, the spacing or quantity can be determined by staff or which um, standard for uh, that type of application. Uh, I just want to, uh, okay. So there's approval criteria for use permits, uh, and this includes a significant increase in vehicular or pedestrian traffic. Uh, I don't believe increasing this wall by eight inches uh, will affect traffic in the least, um, nor do I believe that the wall is an issue with site visibility from personally inspecting it. Uh, nuisance from emission of odor, dust, gas, noise, vibration, uh, the increase in height, uh, block, wall fencing will not generate any of those issues, including uh, odor, dust, gas, or noise. Contribution to deterioration of the neighborhood of downgrading of property values. Um, if this was wall versus no wall, I'd have a different opinion. This is wall four feet versus four eight, and I feel that does not contribute to the deterioration of the neighborhood. Uh, number four, compatibility with existing surrounding structures. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, the clear vision triangle for westbound traffic on citation has been obstructed. 
um, and it remains obstructed. It's not this property owner's uh, improvements that have caused that, uh, but they are in the fact in the, in the city's right of way. The addition of the wall further diminishes visibility of southbound traffic on, on Los Feliz somewhat, but that wall is permitted, so it's, that's not what's on the table, whether to have that wall or not. Uh, and number five, adequate control of disruptive behavior inside and outside the premises. Uh, the additional height does not impede natural surveillance to any significant degree. Uh, in my opinion, it is eight inches, but I don't believe that's significant in terms of the surveillance and community policing and uh, design aspects we'd like to see for safe neighborhoods. So as such, your request for use permit is approved, subject uh, to the condition in the, in the staff report, Officer number one, uh, for permits as submitted, and number two, the installation of shrubs and accent plants along the part of the wall that's in the front yard setback. Here, Officer Williams, uh, sorry to go back, but um, do you th in my opinion, I'm thinking that maybe condition number two about removal of the trees, uh, maybe we could rephrase that condition so that they can contact transportation and if, to legitimize the concern and then um, leave it up to uh, the property owner and traffic engineering on how and who would be responsible for removal of the trees if it is a concern to um, the uh, impediment of the uh, clear vision triangle. Okay, um, so it would read that the applicant contact, can you go by that one more time? I mean, it, does it carry more weight? Let me kind of break off a second. Does it carry more weight if a resident or citizen approaches the department and says, I'm concerned about this as a safety versus a, an inner office memo or email from another staff person? Um, is the goal here to kind of bring it, let Streets and Roads know it's a public, that the public has a concern? My concern is that the, the landscaping is in public right of way and not on their property. So responsibility of the removal of the landscaping, um, I, it's it's kind of a gray area of who's responsible for mm -hmm. for complying with this condition, whether it's the city or the property owner. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm still at a loss for how this condition would read. Um, to be honest with you, I have the condition. You have it. Okay. You have it for the record? Planning, yes. Planning staff shall contact the traffic division in the city of Tempe to discuss Very good. the concerns expressed regarding the clear vision triangle and the cluster of trees in the right of way. Great. I like that. Thank you, staff, for your late night work on that. Crafting as you go is mm -hmm. always difficult. Um, okay, so it's approved now subject to three conditions. Uh, did you follow us with that discussion? I think I did. We'll this, this, not we, but. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. As far as I understood, I'm going to wait to be addressed about the corner shrubbery. And then um, I'm responsible for putting in landscaping um, along the edge outside of the wall. Correct. Staff, you agree? Incur so um, I don't know if there's a permit required for that wall. Do you have the paperwork done for the wall at this point? Um, building permits aren't required for uh, walls shorter than seven feet. Okay. Very good. All right, staff, are you satisfied we have the documentation we need on this case? Yes, hearing officer. Great, thank you. If you have questions, their staff is pretty good, somewhere between pretty good and outstanding, and they can clear it up for you. Uh, if you do have questions, thanks for your patience. Hi, thank you guys. Okay, well, take care. Okay, that is our last case on today's agenda. Um,
I appreciate staff's uh, extra work on that very much and flexibility and working with me to, to get to that to get to that decision that is appreciated. Uh, that is our last case for today. The next meeting of the City of Tempe hearing officer will be on Tuesday, February 20th, 2018. Uh, Mr. Abrahamson, anything you'd like to add? No hearing officer Williams, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abrahamson. Uh, there's, seeing that there's nothing else, today's meeting is adjourned.